or when, when something first starts, you don't know how it's going to unfold. Welcome to season four of Self Careish, a show about being selfish with care, brought to you by the Plotline Journal. I'm Megan, your host, and this season is all around the topic of healing, whether it's after a breakup or maybe it's something big that's happened to you. Either way, I'm so glad you're here. Let's get into it. Well, we've been doing a lot of healing this season, as you know. And we've been talking to mentors and experts about, you know, how to cultivate a sense of positivity when you're potentially maybe a little bit jaded with life. But I think the best people to get healing advice from is sometimes those people who've really gone through the wild experiences. And author Nicole Madigan definitely qualifies for that. Nicole is a journalist who found herself at the mercy of a stalker after going through an already painful divorce. So she became single, she met a great guy, she started dating him, and then the messages would start. Over the years, she would receive hundreds to thousands of vicious, personally attacking texts, calling her things like a rat, abusing her, swearing at her, threatening her, And even going so far as to contact her family, her friends, and her ex-husband. And it's all documented in her book, Obsession, a journalist and victim survivor's investigation into stalking. And when I say it's a gripping read, I really mean it. But yes, I put this interview into the healing season because that's the fascinating thing about traumatic events. You have to get to the other side of them to, you know, just carry on through life. And how do you even do that after going through something like that? Well, in this interview, we get into it. Enjoy. Nicole, hi. (laughs) I am so glad we finally got this chat together. But before we go into anything too deeply, I wanted to just kick off the show and start by saying that I'm really sorry. Um, Mostly for any time that I have made a joke about like, oh, they're stalking me or I'm stalking them or I'm just having a stalk. Like, you know, when you look up someone on Instagram, because before reading your book, I very much had this notion of what being stalked would was like. And it just seemed like something out of like a 90s thriller movie. But reading your book, every story was so grounded in reality and they all started so innocuously. I guess what my question is, would you say that changing the public's perception of stalking was the primary goal for you when you first wrote Obsession? For instance, like I love that you started it with your own story in which the stalker was a woman because I always perceive stalkers to be men for some reason. Yeah, definitely. I think, as you say, that kind of colloquialism of the word stalking is pretty common. Um, Everybody does it. And I did it as well um, before this happened to me all the time. I mean, I think everybody does. And, And that's probably to do with A, movies and stories about stalking and B, social media and the way we view social media and the way we view social media stalking as kind of a bit of fun. So, yes, the, the main goal in writing Obsession was to change that perception and the reason it's important I think to change that perception is so that people who are experiencing it feel comfortable talking about it and when they do they get the help or support that they need because it, while we're all thinking of it as a bit of a joke it's it makes it that much harder to talk about and that much more difficult to get any action around. Yeah there is literally so much to discuss around this topic and especially right now with the Australian political landscape because there is so much data around attacks on women. One woman a week is unalive through to domestic violence so but Actually, just to stick to your book for a minute, because I know we'll go down the other tangent soon, but I wanted to tell you that while I was reading your book, I would often pause and then I would try to put myself into the shoes of someone who was experiencing a stalker. And this is going to sound so left field, but the first feeling that came up when I was imagining it was this weird, was a sense of shame. And I don't know why that feeling came up, because... I was like, why would someone who's getting stalked feel shame? Shouldn't the stalker feel shame? 
I don't know. Yeah, no, you're 100% spot on. Uh, I felt that and almost everybody I spoke to felt that. And I think there's a few reasons for that. I think the first one is even the notion of a stalker. I guess, you know, the motivation behind that stalking is kind of a fixation or an obsession. And it's quite hard to to say that out loud um, without feeling like you're going to be judged or this person's become obsessed with me or they're fixated on me. It's just a, it's a really hard thing to, to say out loud um, and say it seriously without people judging you. And I think also the nature of stalking in that someone is obsessed or fixated is that the, the content or the the type of thing that is happening is often really distasteful or really ugly or unpleasant. So it becomes something you don't really want to broadcast to everybody, especially when you assume that nobody's going to take you very seriously anyway. So you're kind of putting yourself out there and then and embarrassing yourself, uh, quote unquote, for no good reason. So the sort of the instinct is to just hide it all away, not tell anybody and try to follow that golden rule of ignore this person and they will go away, which um, evidently they, someone engaging in proper stalking does not do. Yeah, that was the really interesting part about reading your own story. And I don't know how deep you would like to go into your own experiences, but you talk about it in the book. So we'll just, we'll cover what's in the book. But that you talked about the relentless abusive text you texts that you would get from this woman but what what are, can you share some of the details around the complex emotions that you felt like why if you're getting these very abusive texts why would you feel or someone receiving those feel conflicted about coming forward well a few different reasons and those reasons kind of changed and evolved as time went on, I think at the beginning of a situation that ultimately becomes stalking, you don't know that's what it's going to become. So it may start, in my case, it started off with direct messages. For someone else, it might start with some gifts or emails or letters. It could be anything. But at that point in time, you're obviously, they, they might be unpleasant or, or hurtful. Um, but, you know, there's nothing illegal in, in being mean or, or hurtful or even, um, you know, sending someone a nasty message. That's, that's just one of those things. In my case, uh, these messages came from the, the ex-girlfriend of, of the person I was seeing. So putting that all together, it was just, just all a bit kind of gross and confronting. And um, at that stage, I was 37 years old and I was just back in the dating game after a separation and that was what was happening so I just sort of thought maybe I've been out of it too long and and this is what people do when they're um unhappy or you know I don't know so my instinct was to ignore it I was upset of course um but I just thought we'll just ignore it um but over time is when things start to change so in in my case it was quite rapid in those first six months. Those messages came heavy and fast and thick. And then she was messaging, you know, my, my ex-husband and my mom and created a fake profile. So it was, it was rapidly getting more intense, but I still didn't look at it as stalking. I just thought, oh gosh, you know, this is getting a bit crazy. Um, and at that point, I did reach out um, to police. So it's not that I didn't at all. I didn't tell lots of people around me that when it started to become a bit concerning, I did reach out to police, but ultimately I was told there's not much you can do about this. Um, and our suggestion to you is to send her a, an email and I warn her to leave you alone. Mm -hmm. So I did do that. And there was quite a pause for about a good four or five months. We didn't hear from her at all. Um, and my partner then, my now husband, Adam, he never heard from her again, after. Um, but about, yeah, maybe four or five months later, I started getting these text messages from a couple of different numbers, same kind of content, same sort of language. So it was obvious to me who it was. Um, and all those initial messages I was getting were, were in this person's own name. She wasn't trying to hide or anything like that. Um, and then things escalated again from there. And, you know, I did see police 
another one time before I got any action and then it was like another year before I actually got any wear with it. Oh, I hear you all. That makes sense. Um, There's so much I want to talk to you about, but the part that really freaked me out the most, and there were a lot of parts that freaked me out in the book, but when she started texting with your ex-husband, and I think I remember you mentioned the stalking to your ex-husband that she was doing, but he didn't seem particularly perturbed by it, or maybe he seemed like maybe he enjoyed the element of it that annoyed you, you know, how exes can be. Is that accurate so yeah obviously i don't want to go too deep in with with him he, he's the kid's dad oh, but yes. um yeah look i think when she first reached out to him we were very much in the middle of everything so you know the way those things go they're not always um it's not a good time so you know the timing of that for me was terrible i, I will definitely say that um, and it te- and it terrified me because, you know, um, as anyone would know who's gone through a separation or divorce, particularly um, an unpleasant one, you don't need anything to make it worse when things are dragging along anyway. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, though, um, over time, as it turned out, and, and, and he's in my contact, had, had a bit of a break, during that time, evidently, he also started to see that this wasn't just a bit of a, a fun little medal. It was something quite frightening and scary and, and, and he pulled away as well. And and ultimately, um, when things came to a head several years later, we did speak about it um, and he had made a conscious decision to, to steer clear, uh, which was a huge relief to me even after all that time. I can actually totally imagine how validating that would be. Um, But I also wanted to talk about the fact that I had this image, as I said earlier, of stalkers, and I always imagined them just all being guys. But what was interesting to me in your research is that a lot of stalkers are actually women. And did that blow your mind when you were researching the book? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because obviously uh, the stats show that, that most stalkers are men. I guess that comes as not much of a surprise to anyone, but the number of women that engage in it is significantly high. The stats put it at around 10% of perpetrators, but the experts tell me that's probably more like 20% because it's not something that a lot of people report when it's a female. So, and especially if the victim, um, of that stalking is a man. So there's there's less chance that a man is going to report that a female is stalking him for all the usual reasons that, that would come to mind. You know, men don't wanna sound like they're fearful of a female. Um, but interestingly, the research also shows and the experts say, while there are fewer female stalkers, the risks are very similar. There's nothing to suggest that there's less risk if the stalker is a female. Well, that actually segues very beautifully into my question around Baby Reindeer on Netflix. And if you're listening and you haven't seen it, it's comedian Richard Gadd's true account, but dramatised, of his experience with a stalker during the, around the start of his comedy career. Um, Nicole, my question to you is, was that show difficult for you to watch yeah in fact I've watched a lot of stalker obsession movies and shows and books and oddly I'd watched a lot of those before this had happened to me anyway they just took on a slightly different you know um uh you know had a different impact once this had happened but most movies and tv shows about stalking are very um you know they're very kind of outlandish and they follow a similar theme. It starts, it escalates, and then next minute, you know, there's a big murder or fight scene. Um, I was intrigued to watch Baby Reindeer when I saw the trailers for obvious reasons. Um, There were a few parallels, it seemed. But, yes, when I watched it, this was the first stalker-focused show that actually triggered a response in me, like an emotional response or a really relatable response. And it's interesting because, you know, it is less, I mean, it's very well made. So he does do an excellent job in creating that intensity, even though there's not much quote unquote actually happening. It's similar things happening over and over again for a long period of time. And that's what creates that 
really disconcerting, uncomfortable feeling because it's a long time and a lot of effort going in to another person. And it's, it's very strange when you're on the receiving end. Yeah, I thought the show did such a great job of putting you in that icky feeling of what it's like to be stalked. And you could really feel what he was feeling. And he was so honest about the complexities. And I, I don't think, obviously, anybody wants to be stalked. But I love that he talked about how in the beginning, him being a man and being stalked by this woman, and it started so harmlessly, so he felt almost validated by it, or he laughed it off in the beginning. And there was so, he, talk, he was so open about all the complex emotions, and anyone who's seen it will know what I'm talking about. Did, did, did that resonate? That, that, was, that was really, really relatable, because as I said before, when, when something first starts, you don't know how it's going to unfold. And even though, you know, privately, I was very uncomfortable with it at the beginning because of the types of things she was saying. So, you know, I, I'm in a new relationship and this is this is yucky. Um, but until she started making contact with people and going really public, up until that point, I did try to laugh it off. And I did tell a couple of people like, oh my God, like, yeah. This clown is doing this, you know, how funny, how strange, like a bit of a, you know, bunny boiler joke here and there, which, I, you know, I regret now, and, and but I'm just, you know, being honest as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's as you start to realise, oh, hang on, this is not what I thought it was and it's going on a little bit too long and there are real actual risks now. It's not just annoying. Um things can actually go wrong. And so your your emotions do change from a bit of, yeah, a bit of a laugh and intrigue to kind of ranging from fear and anxiety to real um, intense rage as well, which is a hard emotion to grapple with, I think, especially as women. I think it's hard to talk about, but it's something I felt and still do sometimes really strongly, especially because I was just kind of letting it happen too. Well, that's the thing. Like even the words letting it happen are just so interesting because in a way the not reacting takes so much strength. Like while I was reading it, I was like, oh my God, it would take so much energy to just put this these feelings aside and not react because you know that just replying and saying just fuck off would probably make the stalker do it worse because they're getting that reaction so you were self-protecting yeah it is and, it, and it's you, you do toy with different ideas and, and my reasons for doing nothing changed over time at the beginning it was more you know this person's just trying to get attention so I'm not going to give her that attention you know it was more that yes. um but then as things escalated and, and it became very public and, and 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 really scary in terms of you know the lengths that she seemed to be going to and the amount of time that she was seemed to be putting into it um, and, the, and years going by, um, I did think about retaliating or, or fighting fire with fire. Like, I'll admit that. Um, and the reasons I didn't were kind of twofold. You know, I, I, I guess I was trying to rise above to a degree to follow the right paths. Um, but also I was a bit you know, I'll admit I was concerned that if I if I sort of joined this in any way, yes. uh, if it's this bad already, like where else could it go? Um, and I just didn't want to take the risk. Um, that being said, if I hadn't have got anywhere this third time with the police, um, whether I would have or not, but I had told myself like, this is it. I've, I've, I've had enough now. If I don't get any help this time, I'm going to have to come up with some other way to put a, put a stop to this somehow. Well, I, we're halfway through and I just realised I haven't asked you this yet, but what do you think she got out of it? Like, because she put a lot of work and effort into your life. But like, what do you think she was getting out of all of that? Like, did you spend time putting yourself in her shoes to try to figure out what her modus operandi was yeah yeah so and that prompted me um actually initially to do all the research like I started researching it and, and looking at doing some articles about this before I wrote the book um and when I first was speaking to my publisher about the book I wasn't talking about a memoir um I was kind of looking at investigating the psychology behind stalking because I was so um intrigued 
by that. So it, it took a bit of a conversation to to decide to, you know, talk about my own story. But I am aware that, you know, people benefit more from hearing other people's experiences, I think. So, you know, I have no regrets there. But yeah, the million dollar question for me was always just why? Why are you doing this? So, you know, in the first sort of six months when when all of this was happening, it was very much contacting me, contacting my partner, meddling, you know, with people in my family, very focused on my partner and I, it seemed obvious. Oh, she's trying to, um, she doesn't like this happening. She's trying to break us up. That's what it seemed. But then over time, and she sort of stopped contacting Adam. He was out of the picture. Like we got married. It just didn't seem about that anymore. It just seemed to be, I want to cause you trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm always alluding to something big being about to happen. I'm going to publicly humiliate you. I'm going to put down your work, your kids, your looks. I had all these horrible nicknames and there was it was just constant. And I don't know why. Um, when I spoke to all the experts, they put her into the category of a resentful stalker. So there are five different typologies when it comes to stalking and that's where they put her um where their main goal is really just they're angry at you and they want to cause you problems they want to ruin your life even that sounds sounds a bit trivial but that's basically what the experts put that sort of stalker as trying to do and that's what it felt like it's this is one of those things where you can't help but look back at your own life and go well have i done anything that's a little bit stalkery you know and i've googled ex-boyfriends um potential dates, that kind of thing. And I guess the topic of especially social media, it seems like something that's very tangential to this issue because we all offer up personal parts of our lives so willingly on the internet, like as a trade-off for validation or, you know, as writers or, you know, people in creative fields, you have to do that to, you know, publicize your work. So do you think social media has normalized the issue or minimize the impact when someone says look I'm being stalked and has I guess has it made it just easier for damaged people to threaten their victims yeah I think both of the things that you said are true so it's it is definitely technology as a whole not just social media has made it easier um, for a stalker to stalk without a paper trail so you know an old-fashioned stalker would probably have to come to your house to put to put a letter in the letterbox yeah. or or leave a gift or, or come to your workplace um so you are able to bypass those things quite easily um on social media but and yes i think it's sort of online stalking is even more minimized than so regular quote unquote stalking and i don't think it should be so i'm i'm quite passionate about this because social media and the internet is not new. It's it's so ingrained in our lives. You'd be very hard pressed to find a person who doesn't use it or who um, either either to stay socially connected or for their work. It's, it's not something a lot of people can just opt out of because um, they feel like, you know, they've risen above social media or, or the internet. Um, I, for one, used it quite a lot for two reasons, one for work um, and two being a, a mum who was based at home, you know, that's my my way to connect with other human beings. Um, so this idea that you must remove yourself from social media or the internet in order to not be harassed, I, I strongly object to. I think it's it's similar to saying to someone, well, if you're going to get abusive letters, just stop checking your mailbox. You, you, no one's forcing you to go to your mailbox and check it and open yeah. letters. Or, or how they tell women to stop wearing short skirts because you're encouraging it. Yeah, it, it, it's all part of the same thing. You know, if that person's always going to the, you know, the that particular shopping centre, you don't go there or, or just don't go to work if they're going to send you flowers at work. I mean, you could you could go on and on and on. Of course, you should use social media safely and and there are certain rules that we should all follow like identifying your location or your what rules you have around your children or their school and that that's up to the individual and i i apply my own safety rules there but this idea that um if i don't like it i should just retreat and hide i think is um 
is really unfair. And not only is it unfair, it's also unsafe because most of the research shows and all the experts said that a an online stalker is highly likely to engage in um, personal stalking if they're in the vicinity to be able to do so. You just may not know about it. So the fact that you close your eyes and don't know about something doesn't mean it's not happening. And when you know somebody's that fixated on you and you have a family and children, I think it's 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 kind of ridiculous to say, just close your eyes to it because you just don't know what's what could be happening around you if you do that. Does that make sense? Yep. Terrifying sense. Um, and we're at the pointy end of the interview um, and we know you've come through this and you've gone through this very unusual situation, although wait, not unusual, sadly, just very underreported. But having gone through it, is there ever a point where you go, okay, I feel healed, I feel free from the trauma of this, or is it always with you? I think yes and no to that. So I lived for so long just enduring this and questioning my own reactions all the time. So, uh, you know, I was having quite intense reactions, but I kind of, I didn't want to talk about those and I didn't. Um, so you're kind of always questioning whether you're overreacting or you're underreacting and, and, and things like that. And I write a lot and work in that domestic violence space. So I, I understood that I was doing it, but I was doing it anyway. Um, since I got some validation from the police and also speaking openly about it and the response that I've got from so many people who are also suffering in silence and being able to tell them, you know, providing it's safe. I mean, that's always crucial. If you if you feel that you could be at risk, I, then I don't ever recommend, you know, doing anything other than protecting yourself. But if you do feel safe and you can, and the only reason you're keeping quiet is shame, then I think don't keep quiet. I, I, since I've been able to report to the police and, and share with other people, that has helped me immensely and, and it changed everything. Um, I, it, I have no doubt if I didn't do either of those things, it would still be happening now. That That's my firm belief with the way it was escalating so much after three years. It was getting worse, not better. Um, on the flip side, though, it doesn't ever really go away. So when you've had that long waiting, checking, checking your name, making sure nothing's happened, making sure you're not going to get this other weird thing pop up in your inbox or a family member's going to say something or another stranger's going to recognise you. Mm -hmm. um, for so long, it's really, it is hard to switch that off. So there is that sort of element of being on edge, I guess, Mm -hmm. um, that I don't think ever really goes away, but, but certainly you can empower yourself by, by seeking help and, and knowing that stalking is actually illegal. It is illegal. And a lot of people just don't realize that they don't have to put up with what's happening. Um, it takes a bit of banging and a bit of noise making, but if you keep telling people and keep going back to police, you know, you may just get some response, although, you know, we clearly have a long way to go in that area. We definitely do. And um, it's weird. I think part of the anxiety or the, the follow through of like being on alert all the time, does that feeling ever manifest as, oh, well, she's gone quiet. I haven't heard from her. So she's ostensibly gone. But because you still have that trauma and anxiety in your body, as a sort of self-protection mechanism, do you ever go, well, I wonder where she is because I need to know where she is so at least I know how far away she is from me. And I, that sounds like you're focusing on her. That doesn't make sense, but it's almost like if she's gone quiet, you don't know where she is and that causes more stress. Does that make sense? Yeah, that yeah, it does make perfect sense. And, you know, I, I'm going to answer that honestly, honestly at, at the risk of, you know, the same kind of things with people people judging you like you're, you're trying to seek it out. But, um, yeah, like I, I, I can't deny it. It's, it's not something I do often. Um, but at certain pivotal moments um, in my life or particularly as, um, you know, the restraining order was coming to an end or, or things like that, yeah, you'd kind of 
just have a look or put, you know, just to see and make sure that the coast was clear and that everything's okay. Um, and of course, there are some people um, in my life that are aware of it as well. And, you know, people do reach out to you if they see something that they're concerned about as well. I mean, that's just something that happens also. Yes. Um, so that if there is something a bit odd or a bit um, out of order, yeah, evidently I'll, I'll probably hear about it anyway. Um, I think it's so good to mention that and be upfront about it because I think that ties into the shame element that we were talking about, especially because I think I would do that. Like I would be so traumatized that it would almost be like better the devil you know. Like if this person has been abusing me for so long, if I don't know where they are, that's almost more anxiety inducing. I can't see them coming. And I think anyone listening would completely understand that mentality. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, you, you do sometimes get shamed for that, for, you know, if you didn't look, you wouldn't see it. Nice. Um, but when I spoke to um, Gary Jubilant, I don't know if you know him, he's the um, former detective. So he was a, he's a former detective and a, and a, and a seasoned um, a law professional. He had had a similar experience and we were talking about it and on his podcast and he told me that people even said to him, like, lock her email because he was getting these profuse emails. And his response to that was, as a police officer, no, because I have a family and I need to know and be aware of the headspace of this person in case it changes from lots and lots of emails to something else. So, you know, I found that conversation really kind of gave me a lot of relief that I'm not I'm not the the crazy obsessed one because he was sort of saying, you know, it's it's smart and good sense to do that. So, and that's almost the most frustratingly annoying, piss you off thing about stalking. It's that now, forever, or at least for a very extended period of time, you are tethered by this invisible string emotionally to a person that you never even asked to be tethered to. Like you've just got this little space in your brain now reserved for them and it's sickening. You didn't ask for it and it's now there. And that's what I think is, you know, again, according to the experts, that's the purpose is to, to they want those their, their targets to be thinking about them all the time. All right. Well, just to finish off, and I think you touched on this earlier, but advice for someone listening who might be experiencing stalking or who might even be on the fence who aren't sure if that's what's happening to them what do you say to those people yeah so two critical things the first thing is um, whether you're on the fence or in doubt or it's just something that's making you uncomfortable at all record it so absolutely everything a screen a message a text an email no matter what it is or how trivial it seems, if it's made you uncomfortable, just keep a copy of it. Um, police tell me that a lot of people don't do that because it's usually something unpleasant, but it's worth just keeping, filing away so that if things escalate, you can prove that it was a pattern because the onus is on you to prove that pattern. So if you've got no copies of anything, you're not going to be able to do that. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is tell somebody, anybody, at all if it's as, whether it's a family member the police a therapist a friend tell someone about it even if it's uncomfortable and embarrassing and and feels yucky it, people need someone needs to know so that when things escalate you, you've got um some context around it and, and some protection you know someone some, someone's looking out for you for one thing um but you've got some context because from my own experience i can say it's extremely hard to try to articulate um i'm coming here to tell you that this has been happening for three years you know similar to baby reindeer when they like sort of say to him it's been going on for six months why are you here now it's it's really hard to do so tell someone i would say all right well nicole i will release you now you're amazing and for those listening please pick up a copy of nicole's book obsession a journalist victim survivors investigation into stalking it's on kindle and you can get it at every bookstore and nicole thank you for doing the incredible work that you do and thank you for being on the show thank you so much thanks for having me and here's where i ask you listener what 
do you think about the complexities around stalking, especially now in the social media age when we are all so accessible? You can reach out to me on Instagram at Megan underscore McTavish or at Self Carish Podcast. And don't forget to visit doitfortheplotline.com to get your own copy of the Plotline Journal. I love it. It's so beautiful. I think you'll love it too. And I will see you next week.